So, may I have your attention again? Uh, my name is Bill Graven. I'm with York County Audubon. Delighted to have you. As we were just saying, this is our first in-person program in close to three years. Uh, and we can't wait to get back into the swing of having in-person programs again. Our last one was in November 19. We had one scheduled for March 22 after our winter break and that got canceled. And then we discovered Zoom and we've been happily Zooming since for the last almost three years, but, but very happy to be back here tonight. And we're attempting to do uh, present this program in two ways by Zoom and in person. And uh, our fingers are crossed that this will work out successfully. Please uh, feel free to send us any feedback you might have. Uh, as to whether it worked wherever you are zooming in from. Uh, okay, and so I'll, I'll jump from there to mentioning that our program for next month uh, will be attempting to do the same thing of live and in person and also Zoom. And our presenter will be Nick Lund, who is a great guy, great presenter. He works for Maine Audubon. He is uh, known by around the country, around the world as the Birdist. That's the name of a blog he publishes with very entertaining things about birds and other naturalist subjects. Uh, he also is the author of the newly published American Birding Association Field Guide to the Birds of Maine. Uh, he's been doing a number of great things with uh, in publishing. Uh, so Please check out, take a look at our website for additional information on that. Uh, I know you'll enjoy it if you have a chance to see it. The name of the program, which I omitted, it's All the Best Birds of Maine. So he's gonna take about an hour and fit, fit as much information about Maine birds as he can into that period of time. So that'll be uh, Tuesday, October 18th, I believe and the information is on our website. Uh, but tonight, uh, we're delighted to have with us our board member, Lori Pocher, who this, how, a month or two ago, took a trip that uh, I am jealous of her having taken. Uh, I have not been there, but she traveled to the Galapagos, spent 11 days there, took about Two million pictures, and then, uh, but she's not going to show. She promised not to show more than one million tonight. Uh, no, it was. Um, I know it was very challenging for her to try to uh, wade through all her pictures and figure out which one should she should include here. Uh, but I know she's done a great job of that. Pictures and a few video clips slipped in as well. Uh, so, uh, without further ado. I'll turn it over to Lori. Thanks, everybody, um, and welcome to uh, Wells Reserve, and welcome to the to the folks at home. I'm going to spend the next hour or so taking you through um, some photos from the Galapagos. As Bill mentioned, I was there for 11 days. <clears throat> I didn't quite take 2 million pictures, but I did take a lot. Uh, and I think I managed to cram around 250 of them into this presentation. So if I'm talking too fast, just know that you can go home and watch the Zoom program and slow it down um, if you need to. Um, all the pictures in this presentation, with the exception of just a few, are, are my own. I'll point out the ones that aren't mine. Um, the, my one regret was not bringing any underwater equipment with me. So when we went snorkeling, I didn't even have a GoPro. I had nothing. So I put a call out to some of the other workshop participants uh, and, and they responded to help me out. So let's see if we can get this rolling. There we go. So a little housekeeping. So uh, as Bill mentioned, we're in a hybrid program. So I'm gonna split my time looking at the beautiful faces here in front of me and at the screen so as not to... Uh, um, disrespect the folks at home. Um, if you are on Zoom and my face is blocking part of the screen, just grab that little box and minimize it or drag it out of the way. 
Um, if you have any questions at home, you are muted. You can type it into the Q&A box at the bottom. And those of you here, if you have any questions, I'm, just, um, I'm happy to stay as long as you want. I'll talk about the Galapagos all day, any day. A um, little bit about the archipelago. Um, um, so it's about 600 miles from Ecuador, pretty much due west of, of Ecuador. It's comprised of 127 islands, islets, and rocks. 19 of them are considered large or main islands. Only four of them are actually inhabited. In 1978, it was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. In 86, the Galapagos Marine Reserve was formed. In 98, it was extended to the current area. It's about 50,000 square miles, and it's one of the largest marine reserves in the world currently. Um, in terms of access, there's only airports on two of the 127 islands. The rest rely on ports to receive merchandise. Um, about 30,000 people are lucky enough to call the Galapagos home. Um, and that swells to about 300,000 with tourism um, each year. The uninhabited islands are really, really strictly controlled. Ecuador is all about um, conserving this amazing space. They, they, and just some of the examples of some of the things they do, they, they limit the number of boats that are allowed in the Galapagos and they assign the itineraries like a year in advance or more than a year in advance, a full year in advance, I should say. Um, so for example, we were on an 11 day itinerary. Um, after, after we left the boat, they picked up another group of passengers and did a seven day itinerary and then swapped out for another seven day and then they had two weeks off. And that all that's planned out times however many boats there are so that they can kind of do traffic control. So there's anywhere we went, we never saw more than two or three other boats. Um, and it also keeps the crowds down on the islands as well. Um, you have to be accompanied by a park service guide. We were talking before about, you know, if you, if you get an Airbnb uh, on Santa Cruz, you can't just charter a boat and go over to Floriana by yourself. You have to be accompanied by a park service guide. You have to do a tour. Um, and when you're on a tour, they don't just take you to the island and say, you know, meet back here in four hours. You have to stay together as a group. You have to stay on the paths. And of course, they always ask that you keep a respectful distance from the wildlife. And I was, I'm laughing because in the Galapagos, a respectful distance from the wildlife is six feet. Um, and, and often the wildlife don't know the rules and they will come closer than six feet. Um, I have quite a few examples of that. Um, and then the last thing they do that affected us anyway, is they're only allowed, you're only allowed on the uninhabited islands from sunrise to sunset. So there's no overnight camping, there's no bonfires on the beach, there's no astrophotography, which is a shame because it's so dark out there. That would be fantastic, but sunrise to sunset, that's it. Um, so here's a map showing the Galapagos. You can see it was formed by, vol by uh, volcanoes. You can see the craters on some of the islands. 97% um, of the emerged surface, so of the land, 97% was declared a national park in 1959. So all those restrictions I just talked about apply to 97% of the land surface. Human settlements are restricted to the remaining 3%, and that's very tiny little zones on four of the 127 islands. The tip top four was our home for 11 days. It's a 125 foot, 16 passenger uh, motor yacht. And it was um, manned by eight crew. And that includes the captain and our park service guide. Um, it's outfitted with two lifeboats. I don't know if you can see the cursor on the screen, but there's one lifeboat hanging on the side here. Um, the other one is in the water. They're reloading the life jacket. So I took this from the dock right as the first group of eight had already gone on to the tip top and they were coming back to get the rest of us. Um, so that was kind of fun. And the water is really that color. Um, here's a group of our, our workshop. Um, participants were from all over the world. There were only four of us from the US. The rest were from Canada, Germany, the Netherlands, Italy, Switzerland, Hungary, and Ecuador. Um, Daisy Gillardini on the far right was the um, photographer that actually um, sponsored the workshop. Uh, fantastic conservation photographer. If you're not following her on Instagram, you should be. Uh, next to her is her husband, David, who is an artist and a photographer as well. We were super fortunate on this trip to also have Tui DeRoy. She's fourth from the left. Tui grew up in the Galapagos. Um, and I think her parents moved there when she was two years old or something. Um, but she was actually the first naturalist guide when tourism started in the Galapagos in the late 60s. So we were super excited to have her between her 
and Andres, who is in the inset, he took this group photo, so he's not in it. They planned the itinerary for us each day. Um, and in each night before dinner, we would have a little briefing where we would talk about what we we're gonna do the next day. And it was kind of in this function room on the boat where they had a big wall map of the Galapagos Islands with kind of a glass, uh, glass covered frame. And he would take a sharp, another Sharpie, a um, dry erase marker and map out where we were going each day. So we started kind of in the middle here in Baltra. And the first day we only went about an hour to North Seymour, uh, spent the afternoon there. And then overnight took about eight hours to get up to Henevesa. Uh, then overnight the next night, back down to Santiago, around the top of Isabella, then down to Fernandina, spent the next couple of days exploring the coast, the west coast of Isabella, then down to Floriana, up to Santa Cruz, down to Española, around to San Cristobal, and then back to uh, the last morning, we spent like an hour on a little islet called Mosquera before heading back to the airport. So we covered a lot of ground. Uh, my advice to any of you, if you are fortunate enough to get to the Galapagos, go for the longest itinerary you can find. Um, a seven day itinerary is not even gonna cover all, all of this, everything that we saw. And some of the four and five day itineraries really only cover um, Genovesa and Santiago and Santa Cruz, and you miss out on everything else. Um, when I was putting this presentation together, I really struggled with how to present it. I started going chronologically through my thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures and just throwing pictures into this presentation kind of in chronological order. And then I decided that's the way I experienced it. So that's the way I'm going to share it. So that's why we're calling it 11 days. I'm going to take you literally day by day through, um, through my trip. So our days were full. We went sunrise to sunset. And my first aha moment was when I realized that on the equator, the sun always rises at 6 a.m. and always sets at 6 p.m. The days don't get any longer in the summer and they don't get shorter in the winter. And it seems so obvious to me now, <laughs> but I literally remember it at the, the moment going, ah, oh, equator, it means equal. Um, yeah, so our, our days were full. Um, so each night we had a whiteboard and I know you can't read it. Um, I'll show you bigger ones later, but. Um, we would map out what we were going to see the next day. And there were basically four excursions a day. So we were super busy. It, by day three, it became apparent that it was not sustainable. And <laughs> we'd have to start sitting some things out or I was going to just drop from exhaustion. But we'd have an early morning, late morning, early afternoon, and late afternoon excursion. And it was any combination of the things you can see in the top left there. So a wet or a dry landing just means they would take us from the boat. So the boat would anchor away from the island. We never pulled up to a dock. These are all uninhabited islands. Uh, we'd pile into the lifeboats, two lifeboats or pangas, um, and they'd get as close to the land as they could. If it was a wet landing, it means you're just throwing your legs over the side and getting into the water. So you might be ankle deep, you might be knee deep, depending on how tall you are. Uh, and then you walk ashore from there. A dry landing, they'll pull up to like a rocky outcropping, sometimes a man-made dock, not very often, mostly rocks and you would just step out of the boat onto a rock and keep your feet dry. So they were nice enough to tell us the night before whether it was a wet or dry landing so you knew what to wear on your feet. Um, some of the days uh, we would, or some of the excursions, we would stay in the pangas in, in the boats. We wouldn't actually go ashore. So we would um, ride along cliffs or into coves or through mangroves, any place that we couldn't go ashore, we would access via the lifeboats. Uh, so, you know, eight people in each lifeboat. It was a little crowded, but we made do. Um, the hiking ranged anywhere from an easy walk to like a power hike, mostly in between. It was mostly lava walks, a lot of uneven kind of hilly terrain. You had to watch where you were putting your feet, um, sometimes loose rocks, um, but a, a nice, a, a, big, a big variation of, of strenuous to easy in terms of hikes. And then snorkeling, eight different opportunities to go snorkeling over the 11 days. And of course, photography was the overarching objective for this entire trip. Um, and the excursions were really planned thanks to Tui, who's a photographer and a conservationist, I should mention, in, a, in addition to being a naturalist and a guide. Um, the excursions were planned to kind of maximize wildlife viewing and to optimize natural light. So they really made sure that we were in the best place at the best time uh, to get some pictures. Um, so our first day, we were in North Seymour and there's the iconic blue-footed booby. It's kind of the national bird of Ecuador. Everywhere you go, even in mainland Ecuador, all the gift shops, you know, I can't tell you how many t-shirts, hats, keychains. I love boobies, it was everywhere. <laughs> um, 
But North Seymour also is home to the largest colony of magnificent frigate birds in the Galapagos. So I'm gonna talk about those first. There's actually two different species of frigate birds in the Galapagos, great and magnificent, and they look a lot alike. Um, so they're big, they have like a seven or eight foot wingspan. The males are dark all over, the females have a white chest. Um, and the way you tell the, the great from the magnificent bird is by the color of the iridescent wings on their back. So they both have that big red gular sac that they inflate when they're courting. You can see this picture here, there's a greenish sheen on the, on the feathers on the back. That makes that a great frigate bird. It's nice that it's mnemonic, right? Green and great. You don't have to remember anything beyond that. The magnificent frigate birds have a purple sheen, a purple iridescent sheen on their backs. Um, if you stretch it and call it magenta, then you also have a nice mnemonic to remember magenta and magnificent. The females are a little more tricky. They don't have that sheen. Um, they're a little drab. And I apologize in here, you can't see that female too well, um, but her eyes, she has red eye rings. So that's what you need to tell the females apart. The great frigate birds have red eye rings. The magnificent frigate bird females have blue eye rings. And then the immatures have white heads. That's how you can tell them from the adults. Uh, you can tell the species. The easiest way is to see who's feeding it. Um, the second easiest way is by the eye ring again. So that one has a blue eye ring. So what kind of frigate bird is that? Magnificent, A plus, A plus. Um, I wanna share with you a video of a male trying to attract a female. It's not just a spectacle, but the sound that comes out of these birds is like nothing I would have expected. It doesn't sound like anything natural. It sounds like, well, I'll let you hear it, but think about when you're listening to it, I'll play it twice, what musical instrument or what kind of device um, this kind of sound should be coming from. Is it loud enough? Say it again. Does that remind you of anything? Sound like anything? I think it's called a slide whistle, right? The and then the, a new, like a New Year's Eve noisemaker, that rattling sound that it makes. Crazy. And, and again, I was more than six feet away. I took this with my iPhone from the path, less than 10 feet away from this bird. He couldn't care less. He had his mind elsewhere. Um, and then the blue-footed boobies, a huge nesting colony of blue-footed boobies. Um, there's actually three species of boobies in the Galapagos. The, the blue-footed are about two and a half feet tall with about a five foot wingspan. They only weigh about three and a half to five pounds. They nest on the ground. You can see on the top left, um, he's got three eggs or she's got three eggs in a, in a scrape. Um, typically, I think 80% of the time they said there's only two eggs. So the, our, our park service guide was super excited to see three eggs with, with this particular clutch. Um, on the top right, you can see some of the courtship behavior. Uh, they stomp those and wave those big blue, beautiful feet trying to catch the female's attention. And on the bottom left, you know, head and tail pointed to the sky and they hold their wings at all these kind of weird, weird angles. And on the bottom right, you can see a nest um, with two young chicks and they start out all white. So these were probably only less than a week old. We also saw a lot of land iguanas on North Seymour. Um, these guys are endemic to Galapagos and they're one of the largest lizards in the world. They're three to five feet long. These things are huge and they can weigh up to 25 pounds, which is like one of my dogs. I mean, they're big. Um, I love the camo on these guys. The You can see the inspiration for army fatigues on the top right. Um, they look... Even the bright orange the, is a, almost a perfect match to the color of the rocks where they live. So you have, really have to watch where you're walking in the Galapagos. Uh, and in the upper left, you can see one kind of noshing on a prickly pear cactus, which is what makes up um, a large portion of their diet. Um, and like a lot of animals, when you're, when you're photographing wildlife, they always tell you to try to get like a three-quarter profile. Um, but when they look straight at you, they don't look like animals anymore. They start to look like humans, right? So you can, you start to anthrop, anthrop more, I can't say that word. Um, but anyway, it looks like he's smiling. And it makes me, it makes me smile every time I look at that picture. Uh, we also saw our, uh, a couple more endemic species on North Seymour, um, the first of Darwin's finches. So there's a group of, I want to say 13 or 14 Darwin's finches that he discovered um, or named. Uh, the small ground finch was the first one, and there's um, 
small, medium, and large ground finches, very original. Uh, this, the, and the size description is only partly about the bird. It's more about the size and shape of the bill relative to its head. So the small ground finch has a pointy, slender kind of conical bill. Um, and I'll show you the medium and large. Uh, we saw those in subsequent days. Galapagos sea lions, also a species that's endemic to the Galapagos. They were kind of posing and splashing around in the tide pools. And then swallow-tailed gulls, I'll talk about more in a bit, but we did see our first ones there. So I wanted to catalog them. So our first afternoon was like, wow, how are we gonna top that? Well, we did. Um, the next, I mentioned after dinner, we headed north to uh, Henovesa. Um, took about eight hours. It was a rough crossing over open water. There was not a lot of sleeping going on that night. Um, we arrived just before sunrise, started the morning on Darwin Bay. Um, then there was a, the first snorkeling opportunity. It was more of a practice. There wasn't much to see. The water was super murky. Um, and after lunch, we spent a couple hours in the pangas along the cliffs. And then we walked along a lava trail to the top of El Barranco. So here's day two. Uh, Darwin Bay, they refer to it as Bird Island, but the, the, the welcoming committee was sea lions. Um, they were on the beach, they were on the paths. Again, trying to keep six feet away from these animals when they're laying diagonally across the path and there's ground nesting shorebirds on either side, you can't physically keep six feet away from them. So we just tried to tiptoe around them and not disturb them as best we could. Honestly, they couldn't care less. Maybe they'd open one eye, lift up a head, look, and then go back to sleep. So that was fine. Uh, the second booby species, the red-footed booby, um, they're the smallest of the three, about 28 inches tall. Um, these guys nest in trees and they're the only species of booby in the Galapagos that has an opposable toe. So they're the only ones that can actually perch on branches. Uh, so if you see a booby in a tree, it's a red-footed booby. Mm -hmm. um, the color on their faces, the bottom picture in the center there, Again, 10 or 15 feet away, I had a 400 millimeter zoom that I was shooting with, which uh, allowed me to get some of that beautiful color and detail. They were just spectacular looking. And then the swallow-tailed gulls, these also nest in the ground. These are the ones we're tiptoeing around trying to get past the sea lions. Um, any, I'm gonna ask you a question and sorry, the zoom people can't answer, but um, anything strike you about these birds? Anything jump out at you? The size of the eye. A plus Dan Gardoki, what does a big eye mean on a bird or any animal really? Night vision, exactly. Wow, we got a smart group here today. Yeah, they're nocturnal. They're the only not fully nocturnal species of gull in the world, I believe. Um, and they, you know, bigger eyes, they can see better at night, just like, you know, a camera with a wide open aperture, right? It lets more light in. That's kind of the theory behind it. Um, so they actually feed on fish that come to the surface to feed at night. Uh, and again, they're endemic to the Galapagos. Some familiar faces, a whole family of uh, yellow crowned night herons, at least three very young juveniles that were kind of horsing around and wrestling. It was fun to watch them. Uh, and then another two more uh, endemic species of Galapagos mockingbird, super curious. This bird followed us around. We kept trying to get away from it. It was hopping down the path after us. It didn't want us to leave. And the Galapagos dove, which is about the size and shape of a morning dove, but much brighter. You know, it's hard to see in this picture, a beautiful blue eye ring, those bright reddish pink feet and really flashy white wings when they, when they fly. Um, a couple more of Darwin's finches. So the Henevesa ground finch at the top, female on the left, male on the right. These guys are endemic, not just to the Galapagos, but to the island of Henevesa. So they're not found even anywhere else in the Galapagos. You can only see them in Henevesa. So that was a treat to see a couple of them. And then the large and medium ground finch, you can see the bill especially the large ground finch, there is no mistaking that for anything else. Uh, the big honking bill, almost the size of his head. And then the red-footed boobies, when we got back to the ship, there were a bunch of immature boobies perched on the railings on the top deck of the boat. And again, I was probably 10 or 15 feet away with a 400 millimeter. They were more interested in watching us than we were in watching them. They're just so curious. And we found that everywhere we went, the younger, the animal, the more likely it was to be fascinated by these two-legged, you know, what's that clicking sound? You know, as we're, as we're clicking away at them, they they just kept coming right up to see what we were all about. Um, that afternoon, we rode along the cliffs in Pangas and our, our objective was, or our first objective uh, was to shoot um, red-billed tropic birds as they flew overhead. Um, 
Our second objective was not to fall over backwards out of the boat while shooting the red billed tropic birds overhead. And I mean, there were literally like eight of us in a in a life raft um, in a lifeboat with, you know, so you're wearing the, the um, life preservers and you get the long lens and birds flying over your head and you're leaning back and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, don't fall. So we did our best. We didn't lose anybody. Um, so that was good. And these guys are a lot smaller than the other birds that we've been seeing, um, only about 18 inches their bodies and then that those tail streamers add another 18 inches um so they're pretty pretty gorgeous uh to give you a sense of size um there are a lot of frigate birds flying around as well so you can see how much bigger those are with their seven foot wingspan and galapagos shearwaters another endemic species and much like their cousins uh the shearwaters that we have around here are very true to their name right they fly really low and fast right along the water so um I have a lot of really blurry pictures trying to get a focus on something that's sh you know shooting like a rocket at eye level. Uh, thankfully, one went overhead and I was able to snap that picture. Uh, we went ashore in El Barranco and uh, came across a short-eared owl. This guy was about 20 feet off the path, perched on a branch, could not be any less impressed by 16 people and thousands of dollars of camera equipment clicking away, never even opened his eyes. At one point, he gave us a big yawn. I'm like, all right, time to go. Uh, so we continued on the path, and at the top of this cliff, uh, we found another shorty, and this one was actively hunting, so that was kind of cool to see. So they look just like the short-eared owls we have around here, but they've evolved in a very different hunting style. So here you'll see them kind of soaring over a marsh, like a harrier, sometimes with a harrier, um, looking for voles. These guys feed mostly on petrels, uh, little Galapagos petrels, little birds that nest in the crevices, deep in the crevices between the rocks. So they've evolved their hunting style. They just find a crevice and wait. So in the top left, you can see he was kind of, least, kind of surveying the whole area. And then in the bottom right, he was hunkered down waiting. He must've seen a bird either go in or come out and he was waiting uh, to pounce. We didn't see him catch anything, uh, but it was really cool. And then the frigate birds, frigate, a frigate is a warship, right? So they're, they're, that's how they got their name. They're actually referred to by a lot of people as the pirates of the sea. They don't hunt, they don't fish, they don't scavenge, they steal food from other birds. Um, and you can see in this picture, the one on the top left, kind of at, at 10 o'clock, has a Galapagos petrel in its mouth. And the other ones were all mobbing him, trying to get him to drop it so they could grab it. And he probably stole it from somebody else. And they just pass it around until someone finally eats it. Um, Overnight, we motored back down to Santiago and we spent the morning on at Agus Port and the afternoon at Buccaneers Cove. So there's a quick look at our agenda. Agus Port is a beautiful black sand beach, tons of Sally Lightfoot crabs, and also quite a few marine iguanas. Um, we spent over an hour on this tiny little short stretch of beach. Um, and for me, I was just, I was losing my mind. Like the juxtaposition of these brightly colored crabs on the black rock and the black sand was just amazing. The most amazing compositions. I have hundreds, hundreds of pictures like this. I'll just, I'll stop at five or six. Um, and, and most of the crabs, I'll tell you, were pretty solitary. Um, if, if one got too close to another, the first one would just move away. Um, there were a couple of exceptions, a couple of couples that looked like they were courting. Um, the middle picture on the on the right, the bigger one is a male, the smaller one is a female. Um, most of the solo crabs, if you move too fast or made a noise or got too close, they would scurry away. These two, you could have sat down right next to them and they would not have moved. They only had eyes for each other. It was amazing little love connection happening. Uh, we got there right as the sun was coming up. So we got some great silhouettes. This is a brown pelican. Um, diving for fish and the brown naughties, I'll show you what they actually look like in a, in a little bit, but um, they basically swim alongside or dive alongside the uh, pelicans and try to steal fish out of their mouth when they come up. So a lot like the frigate birds, they're very opportunistic. Um, and another uh, endemic bird, a lava heron, this one, I was, I was literally taking a picture of that crab. <laughs> I think I showed you that the picture was on a previous, previous slide and this lava heron just photobombed me and so fast, came and went, just scurried across so fast. I didn't even know what it was. I, I didn't realize I had a new bird till I got back to the boat. I thought it was another yellow crowned night heron. Um, so a lava heron, looks a lot like a green heron around here, but um, 
lava heron as the species. And then our first really good looks at marine iguanas. Um, and again, the silhouettes at sunrise were fantastic. Um, these guys are also kind of not as big as the land iguanas, mostly in the two to three foot range. Um, but I guess the size varies by island. So some islands have bigger versions and others have smaller. Most of the ones we saw were in that two to three foot range. Um, they can grow to be more than four feet and weigh 25 to 30 pounds. So again, size of my dog, which is crazy. Um, anyone know what a group of iguanas is called? So we got a Congress of Eagles, a murder of crows. What do you think a group of iguanas is called? A mess. A mess. M-E-S-S. -S. Yeah. No, no, for real. For real. A plus, Monica. A mess of iguanas. And whoever came up with that name knew what they were talking about. Uh, they're really funny. So here's one swimming across a tide pool. They haul themselves out and immediately are not graceful. They're super clumsy. First thing they do is blow the salt out of their noses. And then they find a spot to kind of haul out on the rock. And when I say find a spot, they're not super discerning. It doesn't matter if there's already an iguana occupying that spot. They just kind of step all over each other, climb all over each other, lay all over each other. They don't move. <laughs> it's kind of funny. So I think mess, again, is, is kind of the right word. Um, we also saw some Galapagos fur seals on this stop. They look a lot like sea lions, especially when they're wet. They're kind of shiny and sleek, but they're a little smaller. They have shorter snouts. And when they're dry, you can really see the difference, especially in the lower left. They're kind of shaggy and furry, and they tend to run, you know, light tan to dark brown. Super cute, very not and not quite as playful as the sea lions, I have to say. Um, some miscellaneous birds we saw in that area too, a couple of American oyster catchers. Um, I love the way they laugh. You hear them before you see them, but you, there's no mistaking what that bird is, right? Uh, a couple of smooth-billed ani that are related to, I guess they're in the cuckoo family, and yellow warblers. Uh, and the yellow warblers, interestingly, sound exactly the same as the yellow warblers we have around here, but they've got a little chestnut cap. So they look a little different. He's wet. He, it was raining that day. So he was, he's a mess. I have some better pictures coming up. Um, and more of Darwin's finches. Again, more small and, ground, uh, small and medium ground finches. And our first common cactus finch. And you can see that real specialized beak on this guy, kind of long and, and hooked uh, to help him feed on cactus, getting in between those spines. Beautiful land iguana. I mean, uh, I'm not an iguana person, I'm not a lizard person, but man, this cat was gorgeous, sitting on a piece of driftwood. Uh, he knew it too, he was working the room. He had paparazzi on every angle, he kept turning his head, like here, get my good side, it was really funny. And a couple of butterflies and a, a fritillary landed nearby. Um, I actually skipped the, sh the snorkel excursion that first day, they said it was murky, we weren't gonna see anything. But one of the other workshop participants, Howard, sent me this video of a black tipped reef shark that he got that first day with his GoPro. Um, they're about five or six feet long, so they're not huge. Um, and supposedly they're curious and very docile. So nothing to be concerned about if you see a reef shark heading your way. Um, in the afternoon, we took another panga ride along Buccaneers Cove, and then we landed on Espumia Beach, which was really fun. Um, we saw our third species of booby in the cove, um, the Nazca boobies. These guys are the largest. They're about three feet tall with a five or six foot wingspan. They look like gannets, don't they? Um, related to gannets. Um, again, they only weigh about th between three and five pounds. So, you know, the, the blue-footed nest in the sand, in a scrape in the sand, the red-footed nest in trees, these guys nest on bare ground, usually near rocky cliffs. So our best looks at the Nazca boobies were usually from the pangas. We went around through this cove and saw a couple of fur seals, and we watched this particular pair have the same conversation over and over and over again. So the younger male in the water kept approaching the female on the rocks, and we couldn't, it was some debate whether it was a romantic overture or maybe last year's offspring looking for a handout, hard to tell, but either way, she wanted nothing to do with him and she kept telling him and he kept coming back for more and he would not be deterred. Um, here's a look at the brown naughty and again, some fantastic camouflage on this guy, right? Blends in so well. They're like, oh, there's some brown naughties. We're like, where, where, <laughs> you know, right in front of your face. Um, but just blends in perfectly with the rocks that he calls home. They're in the turn family, um, about a foot and a half tall, maybe with a two and a half, three foot wingspan. 
And again, they're the ones that try to steal the fish out of the pelican's mouths. Then we landed on Espamia Beach and we were hoping and hoping and hoping um, that we would see some marine turtle hatchlings. And sadly, we did not. We we're at the very end of the season. Uh, we did see evidence that trail was a trail left by marine turtle that came ashore to lay eggs. And it was actually part of it was below the high tide line. So we know she was there in the last 12 hours. And you can see how she kind of went off to the right. It probably didn't provide enough cover. So she swooped around, went off to the left when actually the trail went into the trees and then came back out to the water. So there probably were some eggs back there um, and they were probably hatched the next day knowing my luck. Um, a little further down the beach, there were dozens of blue-footed boobies fishing right off the shore. And they're the best swimmers of the three. They're the only ones that can dive into shallow water. The, the Nazca and red-footed boobies would be feeding much further out to sea. Um, these guys put on a show to rival any air show I've ever seen. Um, the synchronized diving, you can see the lower right, five of them hit almost in a perfect straight line all at the same time. It was, it was just incredible to watch. We were standing in the surf, you know, ankle, ankle deep, shin deep, um, shooting right up till sunset. We were there probably an hour uh, until they told us we had to leave. Um, you can see I started with one over eight thousandths of a second. I was, I was determined to stop action. Um, and then as the light was fading, I had to keep uh, slowing it down so I could see. So towards the end, I was at one over 25 hundredths of a second. Um, crazy to see. Here's another angle, the undercarriage angle, I call this one. Um, you can see those beautiful blue feet. They look like fighter jets, don't they? Flying information. And then right at the very end, they just unfold their wings. So and they go in like a sphere and they hit the water at about 60 miles an hour. Crazy. Here's another angle. These guys were side lit from the sun. You can see their mouths open. So interesting behavior. They, they don't, they're not like osprey or eagles that see a fish and go in and pick up a fish. These guys dive into a school of fish, um, sardines, anchovies, mackerel, flying fish. And, and when, so when they find a school of fish, they holler and tell all the other boobies, hey, they're over here. So that's why their mouths are open. They're actually calling, uh, come on, come on, come on. And then they, they, they dive in groups of anywhere from three to five to eight at a time. Um, and interestingly, they, eat what they catch while they're still underwater. So by the time they hit the surface, they've already swallowed whatever they ate. So there's no brown naughty gonna steal a fish from a blue-footed booby, that's not gonna happen. And then when we ran out of light, I couldn't resist the silhouettes were just beautiful. I love that, beautiful sunset. So many beautiful sunsets. It was really, really quite striking. Um, next morning, we did another panga ride, this time around Vicente Roca Point. Um, and we had a couple of snorkeling excursions that day. Uh, and then we popped over to Fernandina for the afternoon. And the morning started off kind of slow by Galapagos standards, a lot of repeats. We were getting a little anxious, like more brown noddies, more blue footed boobies, more marine iguanas. Okay, we've seen all those things. What else you got? Um, and then we went into this little cove and we saw our first Galapagos penguin. Super cute. He was molting, so he was kind of a little bit of a mess. Um, I have some more, lots more penguin pictures later, but this was a huge like bucket list moment for me. So I had to show, had to share that picture. And then our first flightless cormorants, which are really interesting, um, a really interesting example of how evolution works, right? So if you think about the Galapagos, there are not a lot of land-based predators there. They've got fur seals and sea lions and feral cats. That's all they have to worry about on land. And the sea lions and fur seals are much more of a threat in the water. So these guys had to be better swimmers than flyers and, and big chunky wings impede your ability to swim. So they've evolved to the point that their wings are about the third of, of the size that would be needed for a bird that big to fly. They're completely flightless. They use them to balance when they're on the wa uh, walking on the rocks and they use them a little bit to steer when they swim. But they're about three feet tall. Um, with just stubby, stubby little little wings. So pretty cool example of, of evolution at work. Um, and speaking of land-based predators, we actually saw a feral cat. We were super excited. I'm not a cat person, but but man, a feral cat in the Galapagos. We were shooting away, clicking, 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 and probably for five or 10 minutes. And then somebody said, 
what'd you see in the Galapagos? A cat. And then we're all like, oh yeah, this is kind of stupid, isn't it? Um, but we had Tui in our boat and she said, you know, it's, it's not all that common to see them. They are truly wild animals. It's not somebody's house cat. There's no people anywhere near where we were. Um, this, this was, you know, several generations in uh, a wild animal. Uh, and she went on to say, if you get a picture of a feral cat with a baby marine iguana in its mouth, that would be the money shot. So I said, hold my beer and got, no, I didn't say that. I wish I had, uh, but a couple minutes later, the cat, you know, it had been reaching into crevices and, and came up with a baby marine iguana. So, you know, lucky us, right place, right time. Even the other boat didn't get to see it. They were in the cove with the penguin and when we saw the cat. So lucky day for me, not so lucky day for the baby marine iguana. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we went uh, snorkeling in an area where they feed. You can see how nutrient rich the water is, all that stuff floating. You can see how strong the current is. Um, again, this video is from Howard Josh, another workshop participant. He, he had a GoPro on a long stick. So even though it looks like he's right in the iguana's face, he was a good uh, five or six feet away. And while the iguanas are feeding, you, there were also a couple marine turtles swimming around. Uh, you can see how shallow the water is here. They call it deep water snorkeling, but that just means you get on and off from the boat. It has nothing to do with how deep the actual water is. Uh, that afternoon, we went to Espinosa Point on Fernandina where we saw our first great looks at Galapagos hawks, very similar in size and shape to red-tailed hawks. Um, it was actually a pair right over our heads in the tree. And again, hard to tell, courtship or adult and offspring. At first it was looking a lot like courtship and then the the one on the right started doing kind of begging type behavior. It's like, oh, maybe that's the kid and the mother. So again, hard to tell. He did keep flying back and forth screaming. Again, another hint that it might be a juvenile bird. So I'm gonna go ahead and call this a juvenile Galapagos hawk. Um, and the, the key field mark, if you're in the Galapagos and you see a hawk, it's a Galapagos hawk. It's literally the only hawk that they have in the Galapagos. Uh, the reason we went to Espinosa is because there's tons and tons of colonies, or I should say messes, multiple messes of marine iguanas, hundreds, probably over a thousand marine iguanas. Um, and again, just all on top of each other. Larry, Moe, and Curly on the top right. I love the faces, those little white, they're kind of conical scales. They're all different. Like the guy on the lower left, he's got two coming down either side of his nose. The one in the back has like sideburns almost. Mm -hmm. The one in the lower picture, it's straight down the middle of his nose. And the facial expressions just kill me. But again, just on top of each other. And oh boy, that smell. <clears throat> A couple pairs of yellow warblers. You can see the female on the left and the male on the right. And just that little, little bit of a chestnut cap on his forehead, super cute. Also saw some snakes and lava lizards. And these Fernandina snakes are endemic to um, Fernandina, to the island. Um, and lava lizards were on several of the islands that we saw. They're small, you know, anywhere from six to maybe eight or nine inches. <clears throat> snakes, I have to say lizards and snakes, again, not my thing. Um, more into mammals and birds. So if it has fur or feathers, I'm in. Uh, scales, stingers, you know. Wings without feathers, not interested, not interested. I'll put crustaceans in the middle because I was really fascinated by these and the place like it's literally crawling, literally crawling with, with Sally Lightfoot crabs. And again, is it courtship or is it territory? You know, who knows? But this is what we, we just watched them move like one from another and one would move. And now this one's got to jump to another rock. Um, and again, big male, two females. I'll let you decide what you think is happening here. <clears throat> she starts to scoot away and then she's like, oh, wait a second, hang on. And then she starts like stroking his leg. And when I left them, they were holding hands or claws. And then I suddenly felt like I didn't belong there anymore. So I left, um, love connection. Uh, beautiful marine turtle kind of just hanging out on the sand, not the kind of, environment where they would lay eggs. They like to go under some trees and get a little cover when they can. Uh, she hung out for a little bit, then turned around and waddled back. I have video, but it took her six minutes to go 20 feet. So I'm not gonna show that. We don't have that kind of time. 
Um, more flightless cormorants, and you can really see the stubby little wings. Um, but the same behavior, right, that you see in the double crested and, and gray cormorants we have around here, kind of holding those wings out to dry after they've been in the water. They're just significantly smaller wings, and I'm assuming that they dry faster because they're so small. Um, the next day, we didn't spend a lot of time on land at all. We did a, a, a crazy aggressive power hike in the morning. We were up to the top of this uh, volcanic hill and then back in an hour and a half. And then we were either in or on the water the whole rest of the day. Um, did get another new species that morning. It was the best part of the trip. Like every day, it's like, what new species am I going to see today? Um, this day was a Galapagos flycatcher, uh, which was really cool. Um, and we saw some nesting flightless cormorants. So again, very similar postures and even that beautiful turquoise eye, just like the double crested that we have around here. And more penguins, as, as promised, more pictures of penguins. I couldn't control myself. Um, these were taken from a panga uh, along, the, along the rocks. We didn't go ashore where there were penguins. Um, again, these guys are endemic to the Galapagos. They're the furthest north that you'll find any species of penguin. And they're one of the smallest species of penguins. They're only about a foot and a half, maybe 20 inches tall. And they weigh between six and 10 pounds generally. And I couldn't help myself. I had to take a lot of pictures, every angle, you know, look to the left, look to the right, look at me, flap your wings, go for a swim. Look up, look down, look over your shoulder, <laughs> yawn, scream, whatever. I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. Um, then we went around kind of where he's looking over his shoulder in the lower left, the next cove we found another Galapagos hawk and another unlucky baby marine iguana. Um, and again, these animals couldn't care less. We were maybe 20 feet away uh, in the panga, of course. We didn't go ashore, but he didn't care. He didn't care at all. He was just enjoying his lunch. Uh, another Sally Lightfoot crab, the composition, again, the black. This one, there was a cave behind him. So that black background that just faded into nothing. Oh, so gorgeous. Um, the next day we landed on, uh, still in, in Isabella, landed on Urbina Bay, and we saw our first giant tortoises, which was really cool. Um, but first, a pair of land iguanas. Um, and I like this picture because it shows some of the differences between the male and the female. So as, as usual, the male is prettier, uh, more bright. The orange one in the front is the male. And they also have a spine. Those the little spiny things along their back go all the way down the back. The female in the back is more drab. Um, her spines kind of stop. They only go between her neck and her shoulder, and then they flatten out. And the star of the show for this day was the Galapagos giant tortoise. And we actually saw two of them. There was this big clearing at the top of this rise. Um, the bigger one kind of stayed in the trees. I have a couple pictures. They didn't, they weren't that great. He was probably around 500 pounds and they estimated about 50 years old. Um, this guy was smaller. Um, maybe 20 years old was the estimate that we were given and, and maybe about 250 pounds. So a little guy, um, they can live to be over hundred years old in the wild and they can weigh over 900 pounds. Um, the males typically average between six and 700 females between three and 400. And again, because he was young, only 20 years old, he was super curious and he kept following people and other animals around, um, he went for a little walk. He was heading for, you'll see in a second on the, on the right-hand side, a little tail whip from a uh, land iguana that was digging a nest, a male iguana. Uh, he was making a beeline for the iguana. That's a turtle rushing, by the way, that's what it looks like. Um, and the iguana decided he didn't want to get stepped on, so he left. Then the turtle saw Tui and decided he wanted to go say hello to her. And when she realized that he wasn't going to stop. She backed away. And then he turned and we were kind of off to the, you can see where I was standing shooting this. He came over to us. So we all just kind of sat down and he was just fascinated by Daisy's camera lens, whether he thought it was water or maybe seeing his own reflection. He just could not get enough. And I haven't seen her photographs, but I'm dying to because I'm, I'm sure they're amazing. Um, and, and because I was, it, it became known pretty quickly, quickly that I was the bird nerd uh, of the group. So while this was all happening, Andres tapped me on the shoulder and said, there's a cuckoo. So I ran um, and we uh, heard actually three of them. And if you've ever tried to see a cuckoo, you know how secretive and frustrating they can be. Um, three of them are triply frustrating, uh, bopping around in the trees, staying undercover. And then finally, one of them popped out for like 10 seconds. And I think I got two shots, uh, but I got it. I got the shot. 
Um, and then that afternoon, we took another panga ride, more blue-footed boobies. I just love these guys. They look fake. I swear it's a real bird. It looks like it's carved out of wood, doesn't it? Especially the one on the left, but it's real. My hand to God, it's real. Um, and then more penguins. This area was actually called Penguin Rock. So I got some action shots. See the guy jumping in the top right, sliding down the rock, stepping over the, just like the iguanas walk all over each other. The penguin stepped right up on the iguana's leg onto its back and over to the rock and the iguana never moved. But you can see the difference in size, right? The penguin's about a foot and a half. That's a good three, three and a half foot uh, iguana. And more penguins. They were, these guys are um, monogamous. They mate for life. Uh, and we were lucky to see some courtship and some mating behavior. So um, little snuggles, more penguin snuggles. How cute is that? More penguin snuggles, more snuggles. And I'll stop there because this is a family show. Um, show any more than that. Um, next day we went down to Floriana and it started off slowly again by Galapagos standards. Actually by main standards, we saw sanderlings, we saw great blue herons, we saw hermit crabs, we're like, come on, really? But I mean, the great blue heron and the hermit crab literally did not move. We all walked in and dropped our bags on the on this beach right around this rock. And when we were leaving, we're picking up our bags. I'm like, oh, look, a hermit crab, like literally dropped backpacks all around it and it never moved. And the great blue heron was maybe 20 feet away just watching us the whole time. You can't spook a bird there if you try. Flamingos, another bucket list item for me. Um, they start out white. Uh, this was a lagoon where there were tons of them flying and feeding. The juvenile there just starting to get his adult plumage. Um, and the flying and the landing, how a bird can be so graceful and so awkward at the same time, I don't know how else to describe it. it they just, they're just weird looking. I don't know. The touchdown, a three point landing on the, on the lower right or two point landing, I guess. Um, some queen butterflies on the path on the way out of the lagoon. Uh, picking up and putting down pollen and a beautiful yellow wobo just singing his heart out. We heard him long before we saw him. That afternoon, we did an, another panga ride. This was really cool. We came across a sandbar with a flock of flamingos on it. Um, and again, like with the tropic birds, you know, objective one, get the shot. Objective two, stay in the boat. Um, the boat's going up and down. We're trying not to hit each other in the head, trying to stay out of each other's shots worrying about composition because multiple birds, right? They're merging. You don't want a two-headed flamingo. Um, so trying to get a single bird or a group of birds that aren't overlapping, um, worried about the horizon, worried about the, your shutter speed. I mean, it was a lot going on. Um, and with the boat going up and down, sometimes we were shooting down on them. Like on the two pictures on the left, we were at the crest of a wave shooting down. And then the middle one and the one on the right, we were almost shooting up at them. And then the one on the top right was almost at eye level. And that one reminds me of the Abbey Road album cover of John Paul, George and Ringo crossing the road. Um, here's a little video just to give you a feel for what it was like in the boat. Yeah, not for the faint of heart. You can see the waves crashing on both sides of the sandbar, the tide was coming in. So we stayed there for like an hour going, they're gonna fly soon. They gotta fly soon because the sandbar is disappearing, but they didn't. Um, this is one of my favorite shots that I took. I have to say, no mergers. They're all looking at me, no bird butts, um, all slightly different angles. The horizon's straight, although I may have done that in Photoshop. Um, it was a little crooked, I will admit. I did a little cropping, a little leveling, but for the most part, uh, that was it's one of my favorite shots from the whole trip. Um, the next day, we actually went back to civilization. So this entire time, I didn't even mention this, we had no self-service, no internet. We had no idea what was happening in the world. This was the end of May, beginning of June. There's a war going on in Ukraine. We had no idea what was happening. Is it over? Is it still out? You know, no idea. So the night of June 2nd, we were within range of Santa Cruz that someone at dinner said, I have a self-service. And it was all exciting. And we all spent the night, you know, touching base with friends and family. Uh, but June 3rd, we went ashore on Santa Cruz and went to the Charles Darwin Research Station uh, for the morning. And then we spent the afternoon in town doing a little shopping and things. Um, but the Darwin Center has a giant tortoise breeding center, and they actually raise them in captivity until they reach an age where they can be introduced into the wild. So that was kind of cool to see all different age um, tortoises. And we also learned about the two different shell shapes 
uh, again, evolution at work here. So the, the, the dome tortoise, the one on the right, generally comes from islands where there's food that's readily available at ground level. And then the saddleback, their shell has evolved to enable them to reach up because there's not as much food at ground level. They're feeding higher up. So you can see the way their shells have evolved to allow them to extend their neck a little bit more. So that was kind of cool. Lots of spiders, lots of spider webs. I was somewhat fascinated, borderline obsessed with spider webs and do. I, I couldn't help myself. And again, not a spider person. So I have tons of pictures of spiders. I have no idea what kind of spiders they are. Every time I try to look them up online, I get skeeved out and I have to stop. I can like look scrolling through pictures of spiders going, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to have nightmares. So we're just going to call them miscellaneous spiders and, and move on. Um, so a green warbler finch, another exciting bird for me. Um, we were in a spot called Los Gemelos, which is in the Santa Cruz Highlands. There's these two enormous sinkholes that were caused when like underground magma lakes collapsed or something. I, I wasn't really clear on the, <laughs> the geology of it, but they told me there might be vermilion flycatchers. So I was like, oh, hell yeah, I'm in. Didn't see any vermilion flycatchers, but we did get a green warbler finch. So that was kind of cool. Um, and then June 4th. So now we're coming towards the end of the trip. And I'm like, what could we possibly see that we haven't seen yet? Well, how about some courting albatross and newborn boobies and maybe go snorkeling with sea lions? Um, these birds were incredible to watch. And again, not phased by our presence at all. Very curious, often looking right at us, like you can see here. We were talking uh, before we went ashore about how great it would be to get a picture of those iconic eyebrows raised and uh, this guy obliged, which was very nice. Um, they nest real close to the paths. And when I say nest, I use the term loosely. They just lay a single egg on the bare rock wherever they happen to be. And then they sit on it. Um, they take turns incubating. Again, they mate for life. Um, but when they take turns, it's for two or three weeks at a time. So one, one bird will leave and fly hundreds of miles away uh, to go fishing. And then when they come back, it's quite the event. It only happens. I think they incubate, um, what I say here, two month incubation. So if they're gone for two or three, two or three weeks at a time, there's only two or three changeovers during an incubation. So we were really psyched to get to see one. Um, we were taking pictures of a female sitting on the nest when the male came back in. And you can just see how affectionate they are, rooming and kind of looking lovingly at Junior uh, about to hatch. It was pretty cool. Um, so these guys are big. Um, if you've ever seen an albatross, it's tough to mistake it for anything else. Two and a half to three feet tall, another seven or eight foot wingspan. Uh, a little chunky, six to nine pounds. Um, and those that aren't on nests are courting actively. And the courtship ranges from like 30 seconds where it becomes obvious that they have nothing in common and they go their separate ways to this couple that we watched for quite some time. And the courtship dance is, I'm gonna show you a video in a second. It's really cool. But some of the things they do in the top right, you can see they're both gaping. So there's no noise. They're just open their mouths and kind of stare at each other. They're touching their bills, they're circling their bills and they're clicking together. It almost sounds like they're fencing. There's some mooing going on that sounds like cows at some point, um, head nodding, all kinds of stuff, but it's super choreographed. So when one bird makes a move, the other one responds the same way every time. So I'll show you this. A little windy, sorry about the wind noise, but so there's the bill circling. A little more circling. Now it's the other one's turn to move. <laughs> a little head bobbing. And they do this thing called clacking, which the one on the right's about to do. And the one on the left goes into a preening posture. So now you're going to see the one on the left clack. And the one on the right will tuck his head and start to preen. It's really something else. This went on for a long time. And again, we were maybe 15, 20 feet away. I, sorry, she's got to get the last word. Uh, and again, I shot that with my iPhone. No, no expensive camera equipment required. Um, as promised, newborn blue-footed boobies. You can see on the far right, the, the shell is still there. Uh, two chicks underneath that bird. The one on the right was still wet. So obviously had just hatched within the last couple of hours. They hatch about four days apart. We call it asynchronous um, hatching. 
So the one on the left was probably about four days old at that point. And then one of my favorite blue footed booby shots with a flying fish in his mouth. Isn't that cool? He was trying to flip it around so it would go down head first, but it really looks like the fish is trying to escape, doesn't it? And then the Nazca boobies, um, the one on the lower right sitting on a nest and the upper right flying. Again, you can see the how they look a little bit like gannets, a little bit like the masked booby too with that, with that face. Um, that afternoon, one of the absolute highlights of the trip, and when I was really kicking myself for not having an underwater GoPro, was snorkeling with sea lions. And these guys were, there were eight or nine at least, maybe more. Super curious. You can see, again, thank you, Howard, for the video, um, right up into his GoPro. They're super slender, mostly pups. You can see another sea lion in the background playing with somebody else. They come right up, snap. Um, go around behind you, nibble on your swim fins. It was really, really amazing. We're in the water for about an hour and a half with these guys. Um, so again, if you do have the opportunity to go to the Galapagos, get yourself either an underwater housing for your camera or get a GoPro with a stick. Um, so Howard's video is much better than my video. The next, that night, there were some sharks along the side of the boat. I don't know if they were attracted. I assume the vibration of the boat or the heat from the boat was attracting fish that they feed on. There were a lot of sharks and we were very happy not to be snorkeling uh, in this area. Does anybody know what a group of sharks is called? We got a mess of iguanas. I, and, and again, whoever came up with this name is genius, a shiver, a shiver of sharks, yeah. Um, and then our last full day, um, a few more close encounters, again, with some juveniles, especially. Um, this little Nazca booby chick, how cute is he? He hadn't fledged yet, we don't think, um, all those downy feathers still, but he was ready. He ever, it was super windy. I'm, I'm going to play a video in a second, but it's really loud because the wind was crazy. And every time the wind would gust, he would just open his wings and start flapping. And you could tell he was just anxious to start to fly. Sorry about the noise, but he had something to say, and I want you to hear it. Stomping his feet, stretching his wings. <laughs> He just made a beeline for me. And again, I kept backing up, backing up, backing up, but he, uh, I don't know if it was what I was wearing or what my perfume, he just wanted to come over and talk to me. Um, he was pretty cool. And then the San Cristobal, there's like four different species of mockingbirds um, endemic to the Galapagos. This is the second one that we saw, San Cristobal mockingbird. Started out on the ground, then flew to a tree. You know, we're doing all the right things, six to 10 feet away. And then it flew to a branch directly over our heads. So, and started to sing. Um, and I'll zoom out in a second. You can see how close, I mean, it came to us. We didn't get that close, but literally that's how close and it didn't care that we were there. Uh, more blue footed boobies. I love the chicks, the chick video in the lower right. You can see the difference in size. Four days. Four days difference. Um, and that really establishes the brood hierarchy. So the other chick always gets fed first. Um, for the parents, sort of, when food is scarce, the younger one is less likely to survive because it never gets fed first. If they're trying to feed chicks that are all the same age and size, they're going back and forth and no one's getting enough food. So with this kind of brood hierarchy, the bigger one at least gets fed. The younger one, if it's going to fail, fails sooner and the parents can devote resources to it that's more likely to survive. Um, painted locust, again, insects, not my thing, but fascinating by the color, fascinated by the colors. About three inches long, they can jump 10 feet. Um, they're, they're super good jumpers, super good flyers, not great at landing. They kind of just like hurl themselves and then you hear this thud. Um, and if they bounce off you, I can tell you firsthand it hurts because they're big. Um, Galapagos fur seals sleep anywhere. This is something else I learned. Um, the one on the right, I think, is my spirit animal, <laughs> just like out cold on the beach. And just the opposite, these industrious little ghost crabs, um, tiny little things, two or three inches. They dig these sand, and um, you can see on the lower right, he's coming out with a big armful, or I guess, clawful of dirt, and then they just throw it. And that's where you get all these little, look like little snowballs, little sandballs all over the beach. And then our last night on board, very sad, we made a few laps around Roca Leon Dormido, which means sleeping lion. And if you use your imagination, you can see the lion with its head on the left, kind of tucked around, right? Looks like a sleeping lion. In where the sun's coming down, that's a ferry. That boat right there is a ferry, just to give you a sense of size. This thing rises about 500 feet 
out of the water it's huge and I guess it's like a tradition to go around with cocktails so we did um, hot toddies these spiced cinnamon rum drinks they were delicious um, and then as you go around the rock it reveals a totally different shape from another angle where it looks like a boot and it's also known as kicker rock which is kind of cool and that little um channel between the two towers is about 60 feet wide so i thought that, that was kind of cool beautiful sunset that night beautiful night uh frigate birds overhead the crescent moon rising it was really really beautiful um and i've gone way over an hour so we're gonna wrap it up here so just to summarize um you know my my feathers my birds i third sixties of birds 26 of them were lifers for me so that was super exciting 16 are endemic to the galapagos in the fur column only three <laughs> only three mammals in 11 days it's kind of mind-boggling but fur seals sea lions and feral cats that's all they got the only other mammals they really have are bats but when you're when you have to be back you can't stay on land after sunset you don't get to see the bats um, and then kind of my miscellaneous scales and shells and such I think is what I called it um, another dozen or so between iguanas and snakes and crabs and turtles and I didn't even count this spiders they're going to give me nightmares. So 11 days, 11,000 photos, I think, was the final count. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share, you know, a couple hundred of them with you tonight. Um, and I'm happy to stick around as long as you guys would like, if anyone has any questions. Thank you. And we didn't rehearse this part, Bill. How do you want to handle questions? We have, well, do you want to get the Zoom ones on your laptop? Can you see the Zoom questions on your laptop and we can maybe alternate? The Zoom people, if they put questions in the Q&A, do you want to read that from your laptop? But we can start if anyone has any here. Monica's got one. We uh, both met with some pretty birds when we were um, in the uh, Cayman Islands, and they were pulled to roost. Mm -hmm. They are gentle. They are, yeah. Epics were coming to. <laughs> they're, they're like spectral. The way yeah. They're. Yeah, it's a seven or eight foot wingspan. Yes. Yeah. Well, we walked the that very first day. We walked through um, North Seymour, and they were nesting. And they nest in groups. You know, there'll be like a little grove of shrubs, and you know, maybe a dozen nests. And then you go around the corner, and there's a dozen more nests. And they're flying in and flying out. And the ones that weren't on nests were actively courting. So you had the slide whistle, and the <laughs> it was crazy. It was there were a lot of big, big, big birds out there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, picture of the albatross mm -hmm. uh, with the black background. Yeah. Is that a night shot with light? No. Uh, the question was about the albatross, uh, the head of the albatross. He was, um, or she, I don't even know, a uh, white bird with um, black volcanic rock in the background that was kind of open shade. So the sun was on the bird, but there was no sun on, on the rocks because of the angle. Yeah. And then I kind of, played with the exposure a little bit in um, in Photoshop. If you look real closely, you can see a little bit of rock in the background, but I just made it as dark as I could so it would stand out. Thank you, thank you. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, no night photography, not allowed on, the, on land at night. That would have been cool though. Anybody else, any Zoom questions still? Well, uh, Oh. oh, bummer. Okay. Okay, hopefully it'll get through most of it. And if we need to, I can do a quick record a recording. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So 
So the first day they said, it's super murky. There's not a lot you're going to see, but it's good if you want to practice. And I'm like, I don't need practice. So I didn't go. They all came back going, oh, it was so cold. It was so cold. It was 72 degrees. <laughs> I'm like, are you people trying to gaslight me? Like the first day that I went in, it was around 70 and I had a little shorty wetsuit, but there are people in like with the hood and the gloves and, you know, full. And I'm like, really? And they get in there going a little bit of I'm like, don't come to Maine. <laughs> I mean, we'd be swimming in just swimsuits if the water was this warm here. But it, it did get colder. I think by the last day, um, it was in the mid 60s to upper 60s. The Humboldt current comes up from the Arctic and keeps it pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, we were in mostly shallow water. I don't, I don't think it was any more than 15 or 20 feet deep when I was in. I only, I only went on three. I didn't have the gear. I was kind of bombed. And you said there was uh, a small area, about 2%, people residing there. Do you know what the population or the number of people that live there? About 30,000 is what I saw. I don't know how it's distributed. I think most of it is on Santa Cruz, the kind of central island. Uh, but Santa Cruz doesn't, yeah, Santa Cruz has an airport and Baltra has an airport. Baltra is not inhabited, but it has an airport. <laughs> Figure that out. So, uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Where did you board the boat? Uh, in Baltra. So from that, we flew into Baltra, took a bus to the dock, and then lifeboat to the, really? the tip top. From Quito, but, uh, via Guayaquil. So it wasn't easy to get there. I gotta tell you, it took a minute. Um, we actually spent a couple of days in keto first um, to make, whoops, just to make sure that, you know, we didn't want to miss a connection after all that, right? So I think we had two nights in keto before we went out to the Galapagos. And then one night in keto on the way back. Did you have a question? COVID testing? COVID testing. Um, the Galapagos was not requiring and Ecuador was not requiring. We had to get tested to come home and we had to get tested to get on the boat because we were going to be in such close quarters. So uh, we did it as a group and everybody passed, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Celebratory cocktail. <laughs> Literally, Daisy's like, I just got the email, everybody's negative. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I would have done. I mean, they, they had plans, you know, if God forbid you test positive, the hotel has a, you know, $150 a day and includes three meals, room service. They're, they're ready if it happens, but it would kind of stink because there's really no way to get to join up with them later. You know, you're, you just missed your vacation if that happens. So yeah, I actually got on this trip because of COVID. I, um, this trip was originally planned two years ago. A friend of mine put her name on the wait list early in, I think, January and got on almost right away. And she said, you should put your name on the wait list. I'm like, I'll never get on. I put my name on in March. And like two weeks later, they said, we have an opening. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> it's happening. I had like two months to prepare when everyone else on the on the trip was waiting two years to go. I'm sorry? Uh, Daisy Gillardini. She's a photographer. She's based in Vancouver. She's a, a conservation photographer. She does mostly cold weather trips. She goes to the Antarctic a lot. She goes to Svalbard a lot. Uh, she doesn't like hot weather. She was, she and I were both like commiserating like the heat didn't like it at all um but yeah it was a great it was a really fun trip it wasn't the heat it was the humidity um no it was the heat it, it, it would get close to 90 some days usually I mean you heard the wind on some of the videos it was pretty constant so it didn't feel that bad but you know we had rained almost every day a little bit at least a little bit yeah not a lot of baking in the sun so that was nice and good for pictures too. Most of them are really overcast, really nice light. They, they did a good job. <laughs> yeah, a little chilly. Fun. You're very welcome, my pleasure. Oh, thank you.